Thomas Aarons with Fishing DMV here, just doing a little bit of housekeeping. So for July 3rd, Monday, July 3rd, there will be no podcast episode uploaded. And for you guys that watch on YouTube, you know that I do a, a live stream every Monday night. That's not going to happen either. We're going to move that to Tuesday morning, July 4th at 10 a.m. Again, the live stream for this week only will be moved from to 10 a.m. on July 4th. If you guys listen on Apple, iHeartRadio, or Spotify, feel free to drop by to the YouTube channel on Tuesday, July 4th at 10 a.m. Now, the podcast will come back and reconvene that Wednesday, July 5th. I'll be uploading an episode, and then Friday, and then we'll get back to our regular Monday, Wednesday, Friday upload. I'm going to drop a bonus episode July 1st. So again, just to make sure you understand, no episode on Monday, no live stream on Monday, but there will be a live stream Tuesday morning that'll be real uploaded on Wednesday. And then we get back to our regular podcast stuff that Friday. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Let's just get right into it now and bring everybody into the lobby. We're going to have a full house today. Uh, that was Phil, what an a... intro. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Was good. I, I was trying to um, I, was trying, I was trying to Photoshop Matt's face onto the guy from uh, Eastbound and Down, but I'm not good with <laughs> After Effects at all because I was trying to have him talking to you and Phil on either side, but I'm going to have to spend a little bit more time on that. We'll get him <laughs> next time. We'll get them next up. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We got a couple more guys that will be joining us eventually here. But, I mean, we'll get right into it. I don't think we even, like, labeled this. It's like the boys, like, BFL recap. We're, it's a working title. We're going to shorten it down, polish it up. Um, this is coming a couple weeks late from the High Rock Piedmont Division, if I'm not mistaken. It all blurs together with all the interviews I do here. But, uh, yeah, I guess this crew, this is our second tournament all housing together. And oh, the comment section. What's up, guys? Yeah, okay, cool. And then, guys, I'll make sure I keep an eye on the comment section. So, I guess we'll go from my right clockwise. Phil, this was your first tournament, right? Yep, first ever bass boat tournament. We're ever. gonna come back to that. We're gonna come back to that. And then, yeah. and then Hunter, uh, if you don't know him, guys, go subscribe to his channel. Link in the episode description, of course, to just his channel. He had a really good Smith Mountain Lake tournament, the first one at the Piedmont Division. And then we'll get into the the other ones. And uh, but yeah. but it's practice too. There's something that you could learn. Um, and then if you keep going down below me right now, you have Matt, who also had a really good, I thought good tournament at High Rock too. So we could break through that. And then um, yeah, he caught something else this weekend. I don't know if he wants to talk about that or if he wants to tease it out for a possible video the past uh, past couple of days. So that was uh, that was pretty cool as well. Very cool. So yeah, we'll, we'll share that. We'll share it for sure. Yeah, could that uh, yeah, that's pretty awesome. So I don't even know how how we can begin this bad boy. So High Rock Lake, what is everyone's first take on that thing when you got there? It sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I was stoked uh, for it. I really I really liked how the lake laid out. I thought it was just it kind of was. I would say a mix between like Smith Mountain and Gaston, just the way it looked in the bottom end, you know, having being more natural and a lot of wood, a lot of steep banks. And then you go up and there's a bunch of docks and muddy water and stuff like that. It, it's also really small too, which is something that really shocked me um, when you go down there. So it's a 13, no, it's 15,000 acres. Lake Anna, if you blew up the dike, is 13,000. So it's a really small fishery when you get down there um, with one massive arm, which I think is Swamp Creek, which is where we stayed at. And that's where I spent my time in my boat. Once I got all my stuff actually figured out um, the story that I have is when I get there at night and um, I almost blow out two <laughs> wheels trying to get into the damn parking lot. Thanks to uh, a certain individual. Hey man, <laughs> I think it was two, the wrong guys. <laughs> oh, two God, individuals. Great. It was two. I was I. I blame Phil. Phil took my attention away from your trailer. <laughs> like I can't. I wouldn't have been able to stop you anyway. I mean, you put that sucker in drive. And like, <laughs> <laughs> Phil, you want to tell that story? Like. <laughs> oh man. So yeah, we're out there having a good time. We didn't even think this guy was going to show up to begin with. It was midnight. Matt's like. Matt's like, nah, he's messing with us. Like, he's not coming. He's not coming tonight. It's 1130. 
And then you were supposed to be there know, at five. I was supposed yeah. to be there. <laughs> I get a call from Thomas while we're watching Trailer Park Boys. <laughs> and <laughs> he, he's like, where do I go? Where do I go? I don't know where I am. There's a dead end. I don't know how I'm going to turn around. I'm like, hold on. Hold on. I walk out. I can see his headlights through the trees. <laughs> like, just drive forward. He's like, okay. So he drives up. And we're like, oh, man. We don't know what to do with his truck and boat because the house parking situation is always terrible. So, and there's two huge boulders on opposite side of the uh, entrance to the house and a light pole. And so <laughs> we're trying to figure out how to get him angled in there. And Thomas is all jacked up. Like this guy was bouncing off the walls because he'd been driving for like 18 hours by himself. <laughs> we read and, five, five hours, man. I was, yeah. Around. Yeah. And so, <laughs> I'm me and Hunter are standing back there and Matt's up there with Thomas and me and Hunter are standing back by the boat and I look in his boat and there's this just massive tub sitting in the middle of it. And I look at Hunter. I'm like, I bet you that thing's full of Ned rigs. And then next thing I know, I hear whoom and his, <laughs> both of his trailer tires are on top of the boulder. <laughs> He gets out, starts screaming. I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> and you two are standing right next to the damn wheel. <laughs> oh, man. I like to go rock crawling on the weekends for fun sometimes. So I was like, just keep going. Dude. You're good. And he's like, no, I'm going to kill everything. I'm like, no, nah, you're fine. Keep going. I, we put a ramp under it. It was all good. But yeah, that was that was a great start to Thomas's tournament for sure. <laughs> then I forgot my... Uh my console electronics at home that had to be like air mailed to me. That was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and then that kind of, that kind of led into uh, me trying to go to Bass Pro Shop to help Hunter and me out, uh, which you guys saw the intro to that. That happened. At High Rock. Yeah. <laughs> How did you not break a rod when you did that? Shimano rods, man. <laughs> like give a shout out to Shimano rods. <laughs> the toughest in the business. <laughs> Oh man. Yeah, that was a uh, I don't know how I didn't break myself, honestly. But yeah, yeah just that's a bad, impressive. bad situation. The but I mean it was so spectacular. It was so beautiful the way you the way you took that thing. I just didn't even I didn't even know what happened. It all happened so fast that I was just on the ground just trying to figure my life out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all this for some one pounders. <laughs> Dang it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, you want me to tell the whole story of how that happened? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I, was, heard it. I was trying to channel my inner Keith Poche and go to some backwater that Matt found. And I almost destroyed my lower unit trying to get in there. I ran on a flat. It was a whole thing. And I, I had to idle like 300 yards. It was crazy. Oh, you did that too? Yep. Sure did. <laughs> oh, shoot. And then I got back there and it was all like six inches deep. But I was like, I'm back. I'm going to figure I'm going to find out if there's fish back here. And then I went to turn around and my trolling motor got stuck. And so I went to like slack it because when it gets stuck, it's hard. Sometimes it won't engage. So I went to like slack line it and it just just broke instantly. Why did you slack line your trolling motor? Tried to. And I, I go back to the house and it's like I had to fish without a cord for I think I fished for like three hours. And then I went back and I woke up Phil at 12 o'clock and we went and got a new one. <laughs> It was ten thirty. It was ten thirty. All right. Oh, what the oh, record show. It was ten thirty. Oh, Shout man. out to uh, English Choice on that one. Only place in the area with a trolling motor cable, and they only had one. Yep. Out. Shout out to English Choice. We had so many trolling motor issues, um, and I <laughs> and I guess for some context for Phil, I mean, if you want to bring it up, this was your first ordeal trying to do this and be a boater correct yeah first ever bass boat tournament i'm fishing as a boater out of my own boat at a lake i've never laid eyes on in north carolina so that was pretty cool with no um, graph with no graph um i have one graph one um garmin striker down view seven from 2015 i think at the front with the uh trolling motor transducer so that was sweet um <laughs> what are you are you trying to get me to transition into my uh my little 
Ah. Um, mishap, or are you uh, wanting me to talk about my tournament? <laughs> I think you both mishap. All I'm, right. Which one are you going to talk about first? I'll, I'll help you break this down, Phil. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I, I guess we, we're already here. We're talking about mishaps. So let's get this out of the way. Friday. Last day of practice. I, last day of practice. I find, um, I find some good stuff finally. Feeling good. And I come back in at like 12 because there's three marshal boats running around out on the lake. Hunter calls me. He's like, hey, you might want to get off the water because I didn't have my boater's license at the time or boater safety permit, whatever, which I don't even know if that's required for North Carolina, but better safe than sorry, right? So I'm like, all right, got to get that and a few other things knocked out. Let's get off the water at 12. And Hunter's already there. You were already there, right? Or did you roll in a little bit after me? I came back at like, no, that this was at like three or four. Oh, no, yeah, back. this was later. This was later, yeah. So we go to put my boat on the trailer because I launched out of the backyard of our house <laughs> and um, had <laughs> we just all had our boats tied up at the dock that week. So we uh, backed the trailer in. Hunter backs the trailer in down our dirt ramp with giant two foot boulders sticking out in the water and i'm like ah, man you know what? it's kind of risky putting the boat on with the big motor and the shallow water like i'm scared i'm gonna hit my lower unit on a rock like, ah, i don't know i'll just put it on with the troll motor so i've got the cable held up in my hand and i got that thing on like full blast no you didn't and, have it in your hand <laughs> well well i kind of did hey it's riley <laughs> yeah i guess no i didn't have it that was part of the problem yeah. so i'm trying to get as much momentum as possible and I, hunter's like hey you gonna pull it up i'm like yeah hold on <laughs> and i have wait just a second too late and the arm the 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 arm of my trolling motor catches the trailer and just in less than a second completely rips my trolling motor off the front of my boat <laughs> you're gonna pull that picture up thomas oh yeah there we go <laughs> and because, so um, at this point you don't have a trolling motor yeah you don't have yeah. insurance and no you still motor. have the phone call to your co-angler coming yeah, yeah, uh, things were getting intense for sure. I think the, Friday I think the night. first thing I said to Phil was, "This is going to be a long night, buddy." Yeah, that's <laughs> what you said. <laughs> so the reason it ripped out is because I only had it screwed in with these like really heavy duty wood screws, which they were working fine. Like I'd run it on a hundred a bunch of times, hit logs in the river and stuff. Like it was holding solid, but it was not going to take that impact. And uh, so Thomas and I had to make a run to Lowe's that night and <laughs> go acquire some bolts <laughs> and run a minute. We got it all fixed up that night, but it was, it was, uh, it was an adventure for sure. Yeah. And huge shout out to Matt for having a home Depot that he carries with him. <clears throat> Otherwise yes. that would have been way worse. <laughs> yes. Matt's the best. It's helped me out sure. with a few pinches for sure. Yeah, uh, you gotta have that when you're traveling. Mac yeah. intros go. Uh, intro. <laughs> yeah, you didn't really help him out with that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Um, so yeah, we're just going around the table here. Um, how did you get involved in this cult family? Oh man, I got involved in it uh, through uh, Phil. You know, I was uh, working in Charlotte, and Phil told me he's fishing that High Rock Derby, and he said, "Come on!" And yeah, that's Come on it. With it. Yeah, you rented a small it. mansion, and yeah. you, and you were did you were you a boater or a co angler? Co angler, co angler side, and then we will have one more joining us too. So as we go through this whole high rock breakdown, um, so Phil, I've already picked on you a bunch. So uh, actually, well, Matt, um, I don't think I've picked on you yet. So going into this this tournament, what kind of thoughts did you have about it? Weights, what you're going to do, expectations. So I thought it was definitely going to be winning wise, like o over 20 pounds. I was thinking like 21 to 23 pounds, all the research that I'd done in looking at past tournaments, it seemed like a few guys were catching them offshore. And that is definitely something that I went 
into practice trying to find. I marked so many brush piles. Like I was sure one of them was going to work. I didn't catch anything but catfish out of those brush piles. So yeah, leading into it, I was planning on trying some offshore stuff, trying to fish a little bit deeper. Um, and the way that the lake set up and from the bit of like map study that I did at home, I thought that it was going to be really good. I thought I was going to be able to figure something out out there. Um, and while I did end up figuring a little bit out, it just, it, the offshore stuff, like the true offshore deeper, like brush piles or ledges, whatever you want to call it, it just did not play. So I had to switch it up and stay a little bit shallower than I was hoping. But I mean, people still caught them. I mean, I'm sure guys were catching them offshore too. I think, I don't know who I was talking to about this, but it's got to be hard to have two to three days of practice and find the right brush piles. Mm -hmm. um, it, when some guys have like 2,000 waypoints, it's just got to be insane to try to compete with that uh, offshore. Yeah, yeah. But the other side was like everything I've, I'd have i heard and seen is like a lot of guys fish that play shallow. Like it's known as a shallow water fishery. So I was really hoping that like, okay, maybe there are fish out there and I'll be able to stumble upon anything that could give me a little bit of hope. Uh, because I feel like if you're fishing more unpressured water in spots that other people are not fishing, that's giving yourself the best opportunity to actually win. And I know like when you, the chances are low, but like when you're talking about winning a derby with 130 boats, like that's the kind of thing I feel like you have to do. So I don't know. It didn't work out, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into that because it, it, I thought, I thought what you ended up doing was really, really good. That's a hard place to fish. And even the locals hate fishing that place. <laughs> so that, that tells you something. Hey, Hunter, yeah. what, what did you find in practice? I found one pattern and that was it. I could only get, I think I ran pretty much everything I possibly could. I ran that whole lake. I ran deep, shallow, anywhere from six inches to 20 and just could not get bit on anything except for a drop shot on docks. That was, that was pretty much it. I got docks. like a few bites flipping. I think the only one I landed was a crappie. So that was pretty comforting and fish yeah, everything I could. And that was the only pattern I could get. I did get a few bites skipping that new Yamamoto Yama Tanuki, which was interesting. I just couldn't get them hooked. But yeah, drop shot on docks. That was that was my only pattern. I couldn't get anything on a dock like all week. I could not catch a single thing off a dock, which is absolutely frustrating. Yeah, I, I tried throwing it. I tried everything I could think of on those docks, and it just they didn't want anything besides that Yama and that drop shot. And I think I caught. I probably caught like 20 fish in practice, maybe, but I think I only caught like three keepers, three or four. It was, it was pretty rough. Yeah, it was, it was rough for everyone. Not, not just you, Phil, what's your practice like? Um, didn't get to <laughs> practice nearly as much as I should have, but, uh, let's see. I rolled up Wednesday evening a lot later than I had wanted to. Thankfully, not as late as Thomas, but um, <laughs> I was able to get a bite on a popper in the evening. And it was a short, but I was kind of finding some stuff in this creek, which was not there the next day. But um, then, yeah, Thursday had a had a wild night, Wednesday night. So Thursday didn't get on the water until about lunchtime. And... Um, once again, just kind of ran around the lower end of the lake. I really didn't go much. I didn't fish much up on the upper end of the lake because um, there was just so much down on that lower end that looked good. Um, and a lot of stuff that I felt comfortable fishing. So, uh, yeah, Thursday, same story, just some shorts here and there and you know, it was just kind of sporadic. And then Friday, I was actually able to get out early Friday morning and caught one on a buzz bait. It was short. 
and I switched over to the other side of the lake. It was a cove down towards the bottom. And I found this little field of submerged timber and I, the point that was coming off, it was a secondary point coming off in front of it. I could just see, just barely see the top of this log that was shooting up towards the point. Um, so the bottom of it was in like six feet of water and um, threw my crawl bait in there and work it down popped it over the bottom of that log and thump, it was like a 16 inch or something threw in there again and it's like a caught a three and a half and then i ran up and fished some wood on the main lake and caught another one that was like pushing four so i was like all right we're gonna fish wood and then rolled back in to the house about 12 and uh, then had the trolling motor debacle that we talked about and so that was that was pretty much my practice in a nutshell i can't believe you found that how did you find that buzz bait bite because i didn't even think about top water uh just going out early in the morning find looking for matt found it better than i did i mean i was in a okay area for it but he actually found the right area um just i was fishing this bank down by the dam that had a bunch of submerged boulders and uh, the occasional log and there were some log jams along the bank too and there was just all kinds of shad in that channel every evening and morning throughout the whole practice and tournament and i was like man there's got to be fish around here somewhere um caught one short on a buzz bait that was it i fished that whole bank um but matt got on him a lot better than i did on the other side he was catching him off the dock wasn't he oh i did catch uh, one yeah. on the dock yeah, that did. morning was that on a I literally, yeah i tied it on <laughs> i'm like sitting at the dock at the house rigging up some rods for the day i tied on a jamaica boa and I literally made one cast, like just parallel with the bank. And as I'm, I'm not even paying attention to it, I just wanted to uh, set my line. Basically, I'm reeling it back in, and I caught like a, it was a keeper of fish, probably two, <laughs> two and a half pounds. So, yeah, I basically just went off of that. I was like, all right, I guess the first spot I go to, I'm gonna throw the buzz bait around, and I got like instant feedback. I caught like a eight incher, and then I go through this little pocket near the dam. And it, I think it was like three in a row within like 10 casts or something. And the <clears throat> last two were like over two and a half pounds. Wow. So I left there and then Hunter saw me like zooming around the lake. So I was like, I need to find more of this and I need to do it quick. So I would like yeah, stop at a spot, fish it for like, I did. I was a hundred yards away, 200 yards. Uh, uh, all, right, all, right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I pulled right across his bow. <laughs> I, did, I was like, who's this guy cutting me off? And I see he has those little angler's choice stickers on the side and i'm like that that guy <laughs> i was guy. moving fast i was only there for the like sled two and a half yeah the sled dude <laughs> oh yeah, man they were crushing it though but then i ran the same spots on tournament day i had one fish pull the bait down and that was it and i stuck with it too it's like normally i feel like most tournaments i'll start off with top water and give it like 10 minutes and if it doesn't pop off then i'm like all right i'm gonna do something else but that one i really did stick with it for probably too long because like, they weren't pulling the water worked. man yeah yeah we found stopped. that out at the end of the day yeah you know, which i mean i, I didn't, didn't even know it. yeah no but i didn't and i think i was the one that told everybody because my co-angler yeah. told me during mm -hmm. the tournament on saturday he's like oh yeah they were pulling water yesterday but they're not gonna today i was like dang is that like a TVA thing where there's an app you can follow? Like, how would you even know that? You might be able to call them or like call the dam. Because I know the yeah. and there's an app you can get on your phone that will tell you when they pull water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. normally with that deal, there's always some kind of uh, like a hotline you can call. Um, and they have like a recorded message for every day and they update it with the flows and whatever but i don't i never looked into it down there 
Yeah, I mean, that's a that, that's a hard place. It it really is. But you, we managed to like forge something together to literally like like Matt. How did you find that area that you decided to like rest in? Was that just by just driving and burning thousands of dollars worth of fuel, or was this map study a little bit of a, a little bit of b? Actually, it was one of the spots that I found at home, like looking at maps and looking at Google Earth. Uh, I went back to like 2006 when the lake was super low and I could see mm. these massive boulders coming off the bank and it's completely covered in every other year that you go forward. Um, so I was like, okay, well, I know this point really, it's like a main lake point leading down like a whole bank to us to another point. There's just a humongous rock ledge, like on the whole thing. So I went there and practiced off like two days. I got the for the second two days and caught them good on a shaky head. So I think I probably caught like four fish off of that stretch too. So that was like, and it's only four fish, but I felt good about it. There's good, decent, like deep water next to it. And there was a lot of, there were like, I'll say four or five brush piles within like a one, like 50 yard stretch off of the one point with all the rocks. So my plan there was to be able to like kind of flip flop back and forth between the brush piles and the rock but i just never could catch anything on the brush piles every time i'd turn around and go back up to the rock i'd be able to pick one off on a shaky head or this crawl bait that's not a bad i mean that's better than what i found so who wants to talk about their tournament first then <laughs> i'll get mine over with <laughs> 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 so um I don't even know where to start. I should I just go through my day, I guess. Yeah, that's how it works. My, my, <laughs> that term still has me messed up. Usually start in the morning at last. Right, morning, morning. We killed we killed the uh trailering in the morning. We were, <laughs> Andrew was like yes, a rock did. star. Dude, he, we were a, we were all three we of were, us were in the water within five minutes. We were so yep. dialed. I think it was awesome. Andrew dumped me in. I tied up. Matt dumped me in in his boat. Andrew dumped Phil in. It was money. And then it all just went downhill from there, pretty much. We didn't even have that planned. No, it, it, was, awesome. it was that's awesome. awesome. That's Andrew. He fell together he perfectly. Andrew's but um, yeah, the highlight of my day started at Blast Off when I passed Phil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all the all three days of practice, the only thing Phil was talking about is how he was gonna make his co shit his pants at Blast Off. He's gonna go so fast. Oh, he did. And then, and then that cooler came flying back about him in the chest. I forgot about that. He had to catch it. <laughs> yeah. So. Loaded down Yeti Roadie. Just wham. <laughs> shout out Tim. Oh, yeah. Shout out to Tim. Tim's the best. Yeah. Tim's but the best. Pretty much, I started there. throwing a buzz bait, just going off everyone else's pattern and dumped one like first 10 minutes, I think, that might have been a keeper. I wasn't sure. I told my co it wasn't just to make myself feel better. <laughs> and then yeah, he missed one on like a swimming frog, like out in the middle. I was, it was very confusing, but tried that. Didn't get another bite. Did that for like an hour and a half. And then I pretty much for the rest of the, for the next like four hours, I just ran my dock with the drop shot. I had two stretches that I caught fish on and I fished them both probably four or five times. And then none of that wasn't working. I think I caught, I probably caught, I probably got 40 bites during practice, during the tournament day and none of them were keepers. So I kept running it. And by like 12, I pretty much just went practicing. I ran all the way up the river, ran some new creeks, tried running Tamarack and um, Abbott. And they were just filled with both. Like it was insane. And that's pretty much it. Tried. I fished, I don't even know how many docks trying to get that bite going with switch it up through a jig, drop shot it through that Yama, through a mag draft, all flipped them, shaky head, all sorts of stuff, and just couldn't get anything going. I really, I, I, it's interesting about the current first time I'm hearing about it. That, that had to be the reason like the offshore bite wasn't working if they weren't pulling water. That would make the most logical sense. Oh, we finally got him. He's in the back of the queue. <clears throat> oh, there he shoot. Is. Hey. Hey. It's there for three minutes. <laughs> Sorry, guys, doing dadly duties. <laughs> the man, the myth, up. the legend. <laughs> yep. That's what's up. Uh, Andrew, so we're just uh, doing a quick little tournament recap. We talked about uh, 
hunter's day took a little bit too long but we got through that uh we took talking about <laughs> bill's boat issues uh just really first thing is like how did you get into this whole uh this whole family here and um yeah what did you think of uh your tournament um well i met hunter at bass pro and um we uh he got a hold of a tracker and we haven't stopped since so but that's pretty much it and we just can't, we've been going since uh 2020 i want to say 2019 Oh, awesome. That's really cool. But um, High Rock was uh, was uh, different. <laughs> uh, difficult. Uh, caught some good fish on a sticky head and uh, swim bait practice. But other than that, that was about it. Term of day was a struggle. Um, we finally got on something at the end of the day, but didn't put I caught one keeper. Is this everybody's first time at High Rock? Yes. Yep. Yeah, first time yeah okay wow yeah well we can only rally's been there i think haven't you been there rally oh yeah i was like 16 17 once that's it yeah you're the veteran then still more than us yeah <laughs> yeah we could have used oh, that once phil tournament day yep your first tournament ever so yeah, blast off was a little rocky. We were um, experiencing some prop issues and uh, <laughs> getting a lot of um, washouts. Let's just put it like that. I'd hit some waves and lose control for about half a second. Like, all right, probably better keep her trimmed down and just uh, you know barge on through. Because my prop did not like full tournament load. It took me like 30 seconds to get on plane. But fortunately, where I was going was the opposite direction of everybody else. So I get down the lake, roll up to my spot, roll up to my special log. First cast, catch one is 13 and three quarter. I'm like, dang it. So, and while I was trying to get that on the board and see if, you know, it was a keeper, my, the wind, blew my boat too close to the log so i was like all right I'll, I'll go around here fish this around this corner and fish this stump field that i was saving and um went in there started throwing around the buzz bait and the popper co-angler caught one on the popper it was like two something like, heck yeah i missed another one and i caught a short on the popper and at some point i pick up the crawl bait and um it was like 15 minutes later, I'm popping it over a log and I thought I was getting hung up. So I'm like, just trying to ease it over. And, um, all of a sudden I see this like flash, my line jumps. And, oh shoot. About ripped the rod out of my hand. I reel down, set the hook. And my rod just bends over. I'm like, Oh gosh, land that fish. It was a five, nine. I was freaking out i was like all right all right it's about to get real and then like 10 minutes later get another bite boom, same thing rod bends over i'm like oh my gosh dude this stone field is loaded like i'm <laughs> this is about to get real but it was like a five pound catfish that i hooked in the back somehow dang and then um we fish around, get out of there, run out to some of the main lake stuff that I had found and didn't move anything there. I'm going to say it's because they weren't pulling water, so they probably moved back in the creek. I don't know. But um, I think my co-angler caught another keeper out there, then run back to the stump field. Um, I lose a keeper. Co-angler catches another one. He's like waxing me on the drop shot, just picking them off. Like every spot we go, I'm like, man. And uh, so then after that, I'm like, all right, well, I guess we'll run back in flat swamp and uh, just start running some docks and whatever we can find. Cause you know, I knew there was fish back there, but I didn't feel great about it. Cause I didn't practice that stuff. I mean, I practiced back there, but I didn't, I didn't try running the dock thing. Cause I wanted to find something else. So, Went back there. He catches another two on the drop shot, another two fish, and um, the recreational traffic in there was 
getting so horrendously bad. I was like, all right, we got to get out of here. He's like, yeah, man, your call. So started to run out of there, get stuck in a wake boat wake. It was going like five miles an hour, throwing like four foot waves. And it took me like 10 minutes just to get out of the creek because I was dodging jet skis and everybody else. Run back to the stone field for the last 40 minutes. And um, he, there's literally like 10 minutes left until we have to be back to weigh in. And he catches a two pounder on the drop shot to fill out his limit. It was mm. sick. Straight up kobe that thing. Isn't but, that um, weird though? How like Hunter didn't have success with the drop shot, but somebody else did. I've always not. I, I just find that fascinating. Where it, is it just a timing deal? You think? Nah, man. It's just that's, that's Tim. That's Tim. My man. He gets in. That's what he does. He gets in the back of the boat and he puts the drop shot in his hand, and he makes enough points to get regionals, and he wins regionals. It's just <laughs> what he does. He's he said sometimes he'll bring two drop shot rods. Actually, he normally does. But, um, yeah, so that was my deal. I mean, I found the right stuff. I just didn't have enough of it. And then, obviously, things changed with them not running water. The fish behaved a little bit differently. Um, so it was nice to feel like I had something kind of going on and to weigh in a big fish. But uh, just couldn't quite – couldn't quite make the right decisions to fill up limits. So you should be proud though. I mean, this is your first tournament and like 18 hours beforehand, the, the conversation with the co-angler would be, I don't have a boat. All right. I don't have a trolling motor. I don't have a license. Uh, good luck tomorrow. And we go from that to you stick a five pounder for in the morning. So that's gotta, make, it can only get better from here. It, yeah. I mean, it did, it, it did feel good. So this is just to tell everybody how, how rough that tournament was fishing for most people that one five pounder got me 74th out of like 135 so it's that's that's insane that's absolutely insane um anyone else got closing thoughts on high rock before we put this thing in the dirt where it belongs riley. <laughs> oh riley i'm sorry dude <laughs> riley's just chilling <laughs> uh, yeah um i didn't pre-fish at all uh i didn't know what there i talked to my boater the night before and he was like he was like yeah we're gonna we're gonna go fish shallow he was like i was like all right so i thought we were gonna go and you know just flip trees and stuff like that so i brought a went out and bought 200 dollars worth of flipping baits and left my jig trailers in the truck and <laughs> turns out you know he ended up catching all his fish on jigs so <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> yep. <laughs> always bring always bring a jig jig trailers, I guess. But yeah. But it was get him next time. Yeah, get him next time. It is fun. Get him next I, time. Uh, had two bites. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. It's Heck a really yeah. it's a hard fishery. And from the locals that I've gotten to interview uh today, guys, you got to see one of them. Uh which is he was really cool listening to him and the fact that he striper fished his whole life and he's only bash fished for like two years and he's getting into this. And everyone would rather fish Kerr than High Rock, which is hilarious because I wouldn't want to fish High Rock <laughs> Kerr. What? Yeah. What? They I'd all fish High really Rock fish any Kerr. day of the week. Because I liked High Rock. Because you can I did too. Up there, I think. And it, I, mean, I, I honestly like... think it's because of the community holishness of High Rock where it gets True. so bunched up. Um, he was telling me off camera, like sometimes when the water gets high, you can't get into two of those creeks. So then it gets yeah. real tight. Cool. And I didn't even think of that when I was down there, but I have 10 foot power poles, by the way, guys. So like when I was hammering down, I got really nervous and I almost lost the backside of my boat. Cause I didn't think, uh, yeah. So that's a whole another story. For Our another creek, I think that we stayed in was the biggest. And yeah, if it was probably a foot and a half higher, you would not have been able to get in there. Mm -mm. Nope. New and that nope. like, that's the whole lake, like that's because I think most of the weight came out of those two creeks, which was Abbots and Swamp, I think. But Matt, so you want to go back? I do. I can't wait to go back. I got two I... events or two more tournaments there, one in September and one in October for English Choice. Uh, I can't wait. I like how that place fishes, and there's big fish in there. Something about like comparing that to Kerr is. I'd rather go fish a place that's difficult to fish that has big fish than go to a place that has a lot of fish that still sucks to fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I just know. edited the current video from whatever a month and a half ago today and I was like I hate that place I hate it Hunter I uh high rock I I would go back to high rock I'm gonna I want to go back and get some revenge I might me and Matt were talking I might go down with him for the English choice one just hang out for the week and fish because it was it's definitely like you can't really say that you're never going to go back because those are the the tough tournaments are the ones where you learn the most. So I want to go back with what I know now and see if I can actually put together a good day because that was a painful ride home. Yeah, but it happens to all of us. And besides, your, the next tournament in a couple of weeks is going to be right in your wheelhouse. It's in your backyard. So the next one on the docket, uh, July 22nd, I think, is the James River. So, and hopefully uh, we'll do a little bit better about getting a live stream done like after the tournament, not like two months after the tournament. <laughs> so it's a little bit more relevant topic. But uh, what are you guys' thoughts about that tournament? I'm excited. Hunter, Hunter's going to win. <laughs> I, uh, I honestly, those are tough ones for me because I don't love making the 50 minute run. I have a pretty slow boat, so I'm usually the last one down there when I do fish the James River tournaments because I like going to the Chick. So I think I'm going to switch it up and spend a lot of time up to James this year and practicing up there and trying to avoid making the run, but knowing me, I'm not end up run, so. But I'm excited. It'll be good to be uh, – I haven't gotten to spend a ton of time on the, on the James or Chick this year, just traveling around, fishing different stuff, but – I'm excited to get back and spend a good good chunk of time on there and see what I can figure out. Where do you fish the Tuesday, Wednesday? Or where do you fish those night tournaments? Is that Tuesday nights? We fish at uh, at Allen's. Me, Andrew, and Matt all fish those, and then um, that's Chickahominy Lake. So that's above the Chickahominy Dam. So we fish those Tuesday night and Thursday night, which I haven't fished any. I think I fished one this year. Uh, Thursday nights are on the river out of Riverside Marina. Can you get into the lake from the river? Right now, or is the levee still broken? Uh, I don't think it's ever worked. No, someone can get in there. There's one guy. He's got the only tool that works. I swear, I saw him go yep. through that thing at the end of a Tuesday night last year. I was down at the dam fishing, and I saw this boat come up to the dam, and then he comes through the dam, and I was like, Dead. "He knows how to, it's broken just for him." Yeah, I I don't know what I don't think they I don't think they want it to work honestly, because I know how to yeah. work. Like I've me and matt and andrew have messed with like running water through it like there's some levees that you can change like get current going but i've never been able to like actually open both sides of the lock phil i think you got a project when you go down there no oh, phil's yeah, gonna jump. <laughs> yeah. Woo! it's not i've seen it it's not that far of a drop i mean <laughs> it's only a couple feet you got it. i've jumped yeah, bigger it's... dams in the shenandoah with a kayak i mean it's only it's... straight concrete no problem <laughs> So and actually, you can't even in, in the BFL. You can't fish uh, the dam at all. It's all limits. Mm -hmm. Really, they can't even two fish years ago, the dam. Last year. They fished yeah. it last year because of some dumb stuff that we won't get into. But yeah, so I mean, the sign does stay stay a hundred feet off the dam. And I I've been told by the guys that work it that the only reason that that's there is because the signs are too hard to take down, and they so it's only there for when they're actually working on the dam, which I have never seen anyone working on the dam. But yeah, technically you're supposed to say a hundred feet off the dip off the uh, dam. So it's off limits for the BFL. Mm. Well, that's really good to know. How much weight do you think it's going to take? First place, I would say 17, probably maybe, maybe lower. Hmm. It took 16, I think last weekend. And I think fishing out here only gets tougher. So I think, but I think someone will figure it out by then and get a good bag. I would think 19. I'd like to see it, but it, the weights have been very, very low this year. Except so, for the, there's been a couple of unicorn bags that I've seen. I think Brad Webb just had 23 last weekend in the uh, Elite 70. So I've been wrong every single time on every prediction. So let's see if that streak will continue. Phil, what do you think it's going to take? Uh, I was going to say 18 before Hunter made his guess. I'm going to stick with that. Andrew. It's going to take 18. Mac attack. 
Oh, we have no audio. Try I think I saw 40. 40. <laughs> what, 40? 40, you yeah. Like, you said 40 oh, pounds? Oh, there we go. Yep. 40 pounds, yeah. 40 pounds. <laughs> Is that on the clock? One, one of them surgeon. Mega sad. <laughs> oh, shoot. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So the Thank other you. thing I wanted to bring up today too, because I guess a hundred, you and I had that fun little conversation over the group text. Like, what what do you think of the whole MLF thing with the Cayuga tournament? Mm. I think, I think it's, I don't. It's so weird because you can't police it. Like you can't, you can't tell someone that they can only catch the fish. Well, we should probably break down what actually happened. So pretty cool. much the MLF guys, catchway release, um, they were catching the same fish. There was a few guys that caught the same fish multiple times in the same day. Um, they definitely caught the same fish throughout the week multiple times. And the other thing that was happening was you would, if like say me and Matt were fishing an area and I caught, you know, a five pounder, Matt could see me catch that five pounder and he, he could roll behind me and catch that same one because the spawn mouth up there were, were just dumb. So a lot of that was happening. So it was a lot of very controversial tournament, but it's hard to, they do have a rule in place that you can only knowingly catch the same fish once. And I think all trails have that Bassmaster and MPFL mm -hmm. both have that, but yeah, it's just, it's a hard rule to police. I mean, you can't, it's hard to tell an angler that he can only catch the same fish once in a week, you know, but yeah, I don't know. It's a, just a very weird situation that, that, uh, that, you know, format change is going to bring a lot of those weird situations that we'll see probably in the next few years. Well, it's the same thing with kayak anglers too. Cause I mean, huge shout out to Nolan and his brother, I think Ear, Earwin, I can't even know it. Earwig, whatever, however you say his brother's name. Ewing. Uh, <laughs> now, yeah, he's doing what yeah. six of these tournaments now. It's insane. And then, of course, Chet Nolan for cashing another top ten check. But if you if you measure a fish on a bump board, wouldn't that be the exact same issue you'd have too? Mm -hmm. If you could sit there and do it. So they ran into that. No one posted on his story yeah. that um, one of the fish that he weighed had been weighed six times. Yep. By different anglers in that tournament, it's insane. And it's also it's not just um, it's not just smallmouth. It's not just northern smallmouth. There yeah, that was a largemouth. Yeah, and someone was talking about. I want to say it was Jordan Lee was talking about it. He said that one year on, it wasn't Jordan. It was someone else. But one year on Lake Fork when they were because they do the catchway release for the Texas mm -hmm. Bass Challenge thing. And he said they had a fish that got caught three times by three different anglers. So it it can happen all over um, in these spawning tournaments when these fish are aggressive. So, again, I don't see really how you can fix it without just not having tournaments during the spawn. Yeah, and it's interesting because the, the format for kayaking and for, for MLF allows you to go to these places because there's an off limits until – july i think for some of those waters where you can't actually fish it so the only way you can actually get up there because they still had some monster bags you, you mm -hmm. know it was insane what you could catch out of there and i just think it's like it's growing it's, it's just it's the growing pains of a new sport you know i hate a lot of things mlf does i've been very vocal about that but on the same token they're trying stuff new and this shit's going to happen a lot and i know people like to bash them for it but how else are you going to be able to grow the sport because it's like baseball i feel like baseball wants to believe it's black and white world war one still and it's not it's 2023 you have to evolve a little bit here and how you do things and i think that's the one thing bass really sucks at is they just don't want to spice things up as much they should have done a lot of these things a couple of years ago before and mlf probably wouldn't exist if they actually did some of these things but get off that tirade about that yeah you think anymore sorry hunter oh what do you say hunter you think we're gonna get a merger now that uh after seeing live and uh pga no, cool. well, that's that has to do with the the Saudis, right? Who we don't have any oil know. money. <laughs> no, they got Boyd Duckett money. I, they it's hate it's each the other, next best thing. <laughs> I know. I, I just don't. I don't see it. And then you got this third league, but they're the smart ones. They at least wait till everyone else's schedule is out, and then like then we'll put our schedule out. It's that easy. Yeah. Um, what did yeah. you think of the whole Keith Poche thing? Which one? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> start with the first one and work work forward. Yeah. He's got he gets, he has issues every tournament. Do you think Bass is just out to get him, or he's just pushing the rules? Both, both. 
Yeah. He's starting Thank to be you. like the Kanye I mean, West I'm... of bad <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> <Keep> easy. <laughs> I mean, I think I think you can't even you can't be mad at the guy. He's all these all every single one of these anglers that are on the top are playing in that gray area because that's how you you play with the rules and that's how they win a lot of these tournaments. I mean, the the guys who are doing the best know the rules the best, and that's why Keith Poche has won so many tournaments. I mean, he knows what he can get away with and to what stretch. I mean, he's never done. To my knowledge, he hasn't done anything that was actually illegal and punishable. So I, I don't think he did. And I honestly, if you look at these guys like Cox did this beforehand, was it two years ago? Anybody help me out here where he tried to fish like four trails at the same time and was thinking about getting like a helicopter to take him from place to place. He was fishing the bass MLF yep. and then the, it was insane. And he I remember um that was when Mark Jeffries was still around and he was saying like he had to spend like two hundred thousand dollars on entry fees up front just to be able to fish all three it was insane and he had four boats i heard and they were all stashed across the east coast <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> dude yeah. i mean john that's... cox is the only one that can pull that off yeah well matt matt's gonna do that in a couple of years i bet yeah. he's got the, well, my, the one thing that i can't <laughs> learn how to fish first <laughs> <laughs> the, the one thing about the keith poche stuff is when it first happened when he first started getting like criticized it was when he won that uh red river i think it was mm -hmm. something like that and everyone was – he won one tournament. Everyone was like, ban his boat. But he won AOI that year, fished all across the country. No one cared about him when his boat was getting trashed at Oneida in like four and five footers. But, yeah, I just – I thought it was a little hypocritical that everyone wanted to ban his boat. And I I like seeing it. I like seeing – I think it's the same way that Matt grew so fast is people like seeing other people fishing out of what they're fishing out of. Obviously, there a lot of people don't have sixty, seventy thousand dollars, you know, John boats. But people look at that, they see the ten rig, and they're like, "All right, I can do this too." So I think that uh, I think we should be, you know, hyping them up more than we are. It's a style, and I just don't think a lot of these big boat manufacturers really like that as much. If you're Skeeter, you don't want to see this happening. If you're Johnny Morris that owns like seven boat companies right now, you don't want to see a guy winning out of a custom aluminum. It's just it's bad business. And remember when Ott Defoe one with a custom tunnel hall i think it was doug yep. douglas he yep. won like twice right because the first year is jet boat yeah it was like yeah. it was a jet right yeah he had a he jet won. to get where he needed to go no yeah. jet boat so the next year yeah. he used tunnel hall and he's like mm -hmm. no tunnel yeah. hall then the yeah. third year he won it and then he had some kind of like lift kit on the back to get his transom up mm -hmm. and, and so yep. i don't know they just are really against guys that are fishing out of like rigs like that they want everyone to have a two hundred thousand dollar like vexus or something yep and that kind of like segues into the thing where Carl Jacobson, he broke my heart today because he had this post where he has this like $30,000 pimped out kayak Hobie's giving him to fish a Hobie thing. It's insane. It has two graphs. It has the torpedo on the back. It has the live scope with the turret, I think, and 360 off the other side of the damn thing. And he's going to go, <laughs> he's going to go fish a kayak tournament. It's like, why are you? why are the sponsors doing this because the optics on it is terrible i i want to watch i want to watch a nolan do it you know i want to watch one of them do it not not carl it's all i think they'll beat them anyways yeah they might but dude those people yeah they're not, not, they're not humans those boys are there's some fishy dudes this is yeah this is a this is a rough industry to be in but i don't know i hope i hope we need a we need a company to come in and put out like a fifty thousand dollar bass boat something like even i mean that's still out of a lot of people's price range but we need to drop the prices because we're we're pricing everyone out of the industry and it's going to be it, it's starting to look like if you don't have that hundred and fifty thousand dollar bass boat you can't fish professionally so something's got to change soon or that's just just be like hey you don't have to run a brand new one i i think yeah is that the rule that if you make the elites, you have to run a brand new boat or something like that? No, no, that's a, no, that's a sponsor thing because Maddie yeah. Robinson is running like a, would you say Maddie was running like a 03 or 04 or something like that? I don't remember, but it's an older it's trade. Like so it's but, a sponsorship yeah, yeah. rule, is what it is. Gotcha. Okay. Rule. Well, they like, they want to put you in the newest boat, right? Because they want, I mean, yeah. that's their main promotion is like, hopefully they'll be doing well in tournaments and they'll be on TV and on live stream. People will be able to see the boat and like people come up and meet them at the weigh-ins and they get to see their boat. 
And anytime they're filming their own stuff, they're able to see the boat. So we want to put you in the newest boat. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I would say there's probably 90% of the anglers would rather like get a new boat, like every three years. Like I've heard a lot of guys talk about that, that it's a stressful thing in the off season to have to get a brand new boat every year that it, um, a lot of guys, like I've heard people say that they'd rather get a, a new boat, like every three to five years. So the thing I heard that from a person I interviewed, I won't, this was off camera, so I won't say his name, but the, the, the cabal thing is this, if you are, let's just use a random boat manufacturer like Phoenix. And I'd say, Hunter, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to give you this boat for free because no one else can really afford a brand new 2023 boat. Now you can go fish the junior bass masters and guess what? You're the first place finisher with a brand new Phoenix. We're going to give you an extra $8,000. This is how you're going to make a lot of your salary now. And that's why you see the prices jumping in to the Toyota series and all this other stuff, because how many people that aren't pros have that brand new boat. And so it really does help you with the contingency plan. I mean, come on, like the contingency plan. I, I've seen BFL things. I'll bring one up where a dude is in like fifth place and he's made more money than the guy that won the damn thing. Mm-hmm. And that right there is like, that's a little shady there. Cause you know, that's how that works. And that's how they can like move money around in the company to, Hey, I'll give you a sweetheart deal with Phoenix. We'll give you a brand new one. You fish the BFLs and that's how you're going to recoup your income. And I mean, the guy that, uh, the guy that just won the James river one, the, um, I'm not even going to try to say his gelato. Name. J- Jacoby, J- yeah, something like the yeah. Italian guy who he, okay. he's a hammer. He got a 14th in the pro circuit last year, but he won the BFL. And I, I looked at it and it breaks it down on their website. And it was, I think, like 4,200 for getting first place. And I think he made What's seven or eight thousand. Uh, Shenandoah, James River, the one that just happened. And he made seven thousand just because he ran a Phoenix. So he made more money because of his boat than he did at winning the actual tournament. What do we got? You're going to need that to pay it off. 12K. If you click on the winnings, it breaks it down. Yeah. Seven, <clears throat> 7,000 for Phoenix. Yep. 4,000 Mercury bonus. So 8,000 from contingencies, 44 from just from actually winning the tournament. Why is he here? To fish. Well, no, I mean, sorry. Like, so, <laughs> like, he's he's an Alabama boy fishing the Shenandoah division. Like, that, that's so he was he was up. At, um, he fishes the pro circuit, so he was up at the Potomac, and he said he had a bad tournament. So on his way home, he just swung by, and he's. I want to say he got 14th last year in the pro circuit on the James. So he. I know he was on live a lot, so he was catching a lot of fish. Um, but yeah, he's he's had good finishes here. So I guess when he was swinging through, he just decided to stop by. So this is the thing that pisses me off too. Um, so you have this guy that decided to swing in here. Imagine if your son was playing Little League and it was for some money. And then Randy Johnson decided like on my way home, I'm going to go pop onto this thing so I can just wreck some shit to get my confidence back. This dude here in second place, he's had four top tens only one career win. This might mean more to him to actually have this, but then because he pops into this, it completely changes everything. And people would say like, it's the money, but it's also, wait, 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 go back. Those are solid stats. 14 tournaments. No, super and, solid. I'm using an one win and four top Fine. tens. That's this, insane. That's awesome. This is that's not insane. Okay. I'm an example. Okay. This is not Jeff. This is Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Phil wishes. <laughs> Oh, we understood what you meant, but, but like, I, let's, I let's know, put a shout I know out what to you Jeff mean. here. I I like, see it both ways, Thomas. Because I when I see like I've fished BFLs where there's you know pro guys, and the first thing that comes to my mind is, man, I want to beat them. So I know there's a lot of guys that'll see it both ways, and you know think it sh- they shouldn't have pros. I just, I don't mind if but there's a pro the in it. Then? The first thing I think is I hope I beat them. But what's the cutoff? Because, I mean, hell, you can even do the like the All-American, you can have pro anglers in it. And that used to be blue collar as hell, where if you win that, I mean, you had, like, was it the first year on the FLW tour? They just paid your way? Yeah. That but, was- I mean, how many how many kids would, like your example, playing baseball? I wouldn't mind if freaking Derek Jeter showed up next to me. Like, that's what makes this sport very cool is it's so we're all intertwined even if you're at the top of the game or the bottom at the grassroots like we're all intertwined we can fish any tournament we want 
that's um, pay to play. So I like I like lining up against the guys that are at the top and, All and right, see well, if I stack up. So okay, we keep going with baseball analogy here. So in baseball, you have the single A, you have double you A, A, you have major leagues. So baseball, they have a stick and they throw a ball and you True. hit it and you run around the bases. Okay, so we got that. Yeah, the major leagues, you have triple A, you have double A, single A. Single A is like rookie league ball. A professional baseball player would never go down to single A ball. It makes no sense. It's beneath his skill level to do that. If he goes down, it'd be like to a triple A level, maybe double A. We don't have, I think, a real single A format to be like, hey, listen, this is just to help groom the talent for the next generation. I guess college would be it right now. And that's what I think we need is a we need a, a in-between step to where pro anglers or people that want to become pro anglers, they could go there and you don't have the Justin Lucases coming in on top of you. And I think that would also we could lower like the cost of entry. I mean, an example is a Hobie. This is like the Hobie thing right now. It's 300 bucks for a two day tournament. So, and you get better bang for your buck. Would you rather do that where the field is, you got the Nolans in there as well, but you get to fish for two days and learn how to like husband fish. All we have is you could hop into a Toyota series, but that's very expensive to learn how to fish a two day. And you really need to do that if you want to fish at the elites or the bass opens. Well, the only way you're going to do that is to fish the Toyota. There needs to be another step in between there to where you can practice that. That's not just the all American or your regional at the end of the year. But that's my thought on that. Thomas, you got any more questions for me? I got to roll. <laughs> got you to go. Son. You want to plug your you superstar over things, here. Got things shaking and moving, baby. All right. You want to plug your stuff? Yep. Phil's Tackle Box on Instagram and Facebook. Check FTD. it out. We will have more baits coming soon. I know no I way. said that last time I was on here. <laughs> But I'm getting yeah, pictures of here. them. I'm getting pictures of them. They're getting finished up, and they'll be ready to ship. No, no pre-orders like some of this other stuff we got Call going on, Thomas. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> so, but yeah, you can follow me there. You can. Um, I need. I need to start an Instagram for this tournament stuff. I've been doing it my personal fishing, but yeah find me there and uh yeah excited for james excited to see all you guys again and i want to go back to high rock because i think if me and matt go back to high rock at a more advantageous time of year without eight hundred thousand boats running around on the lake we can stick a dirty 30 in the boat boy yeah, trip. that is some so. freaking confidence and i'm going to see you on thursday right yeah okay. yep thursday we're gonna we got some me and thomas got something cooking we're going we're gonna to bring some primo, primo uh, urban fishing content to y'all, so stay tuned for that. <laughs> we're going to find the meth heads. <laughs> yeah, for see, sure. See you, boss man. All right, man. See you. Bye, Phil. All right. Um, Andrew, uh, Matt, anyone else need to drop? No. Yeah, I'm out. <laughs> I got to go eat dinner. All right. You want to plug anything? <laughs> I, on the next one i'm gonna plug my custom jigs i got a page coming soon big max custom jigs wire tied any color you want uh and that's it <laughs> all right boss man i'll see you in a couple of weeks at the james and then next time around i'll link it in the episode description so we can we can get that going for you Bet. all right see you boss andrew you good yeah i'm good how long have you been a co-angler for? I don't know. 2020? I haven't really done anything crazy like BFLs. Uh, this is really the first year I've gone hard at it. It's actually a lot of fun to do these. Like the last time I did these, I was like sleeping in my truck and you're alone with your thoughts. It's kind of nice to have a group to bounce ideas off of and stuff. It just yeah. makes um, the whole process easier. Yeah, it's 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 different. I, I've I've taught myself to bring less and it makes it easier on myself when I have less stuff that I need to get better with, which is what I'm hoping that Kai <laughs> help teach me to do is like not to bring so much shit. Yeah. The hunter always jokes me all the time about bringing too much stuff, <laughs> but it's really he shows, up, he shows up with a tiny bag and like three rods every time. And he's dialed. <laughs> and I'm just jealous. Cause I have 50,000 rods in my locker and I can't even shut it. Dude, I'm jealous of your rod locker. Like, I don't know how you fit. So, like, that's impressive, your stash. Can't even close it. 
I don't need, do I you make money at your job or do they just convert that into like totally. a card or <laughs> it's uh yeah it's rough uh, oh my goodness all right Ooh. we have uh jesse kirk uh shouldn't the locals have the advantage hunter you're the local is he, is he talking about james or high rock james james um i would say yes and no i would say the biggest advantage to being a local is knowing where the dead water is because any anyone can stumble into the good stuff but like knowing where not to waste your time i mm -hmm. think is the best because tidal fishing you can you go through so much water to find you know a stretch where you can catch 20 pounds so that's the biggest thing that I think locals get out of it. I think there's a lot of sneaky stuff like brush piles that a lot of people wouldn't know to look for. So stuff like that. But I think there, we've seen a lot of big tournaments on the James and a lot of really good anglers from all across the country come in and win it. I mean, we just had a guy from freaking Italy win it. So if that doesn't tell you anything, so it, it'll go both ways. I mean, do you think, I think the home field advantage that plays way more in a BFL than like a Toyota series. I mean, would you, what do you, what do you think about that? I agree. I agree because I think, uh, you, I mean, I guess just single day versus multi-day would be the biggest thing. And I think local, yeah, I could, but I don't think there's been a lot of local guys that have wanted that open and, um, BFL level on the James. Like it's, I know Rob Buzzle won it last year and it was the first one in a while that, uh, a local had won it so it's just like anywhere else you never know who's gonna win but i think yeah i don't know it'll be an interesting one do you feel like you know and, and i i want to ask matt this question too and it's something i've asked like mccluskey before but is it hard for you to win there because you fish it so much because I've always thought that was interesting with like a McCluskey type and it doesn't have to be, I'm just using him as an example of like, you fish that one water all the time. Do you ever feel like you're fishing history too much and not fishing clean? That's what, that's why I only won one tournament last year out of like 40. I kept trying to make the same exact thing happen every time I went out and it kind of burned me because I like a, I rarely fish down river on the chick. Like I like being up in the lily pads and stuff. And so I tried to make that happen way too much last year and it burned me so i'm definitely going to be trying to move around a lot more but yeah it'll it'll definitely hurt you and i think i honestly think that like there's a lot of guys that fish just as much if not more than me that are a lot better than doing it for a long time so it's i it's it's a very hard place to win that's why i say that anyone can really do it but yeah your I time's gonna it. come your time's gonna come it really is you're putting all the you're grinding through it yeah, I've I've fun. won a few out there, so it's it's been fun. Winning the ABA was definitely a highlight, but yeah, it's it's a it's a weird place, but I I do enjoy fishing it. I don't know why you hate the Potomac though. I like that's so weird to me. It's not it's not that I don't hate the Potomac. It's that I don't want to drive four hours to fish another tidal fishery when I live on one. That's my biggest thing. And I know like you would think like go fish a tidal because you're used to it, but I want to go if I travel. I want to go to like a Smith Mountain or. a a Kerr or High Rock, like somewhere that's different than what I'm doing every single week. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. I've tried to talk him into it. He just gives me the same answer. <laughs> like a day trip. Yeah. Hey, I, can... I will. Well, I don't really know if I'll need to pre-practice the way the points are looking, but um, I will definitely make a trip down there. You're going to win. You're going to win the 22nd. Yeah. You're right. going to win, and we're going to have a massive party. We're going to buy out the bar. Um uh brandon tom are you fishing the bfl no not this year i am fishing him next year i am basically getting to go to all the places for three days and practice and learn before i get back into it plus i already signed up for a bunch of kayak stuff but i am going to do it next year i already budgeted it planned with the wife so i'm going to be doing it next year so don't worry about that um and then what's the other question oh question on instagram that i had i don't even know how i can share that um boom uh, Matt, what tournaments are you looking forward to this year on, on the docket? And you gotta be, come on, dude, be more vague. <laughs> he fishes a tournament every day. It's a lot. I think I, I had at the beginning of the year, like in February, once all the schedules were out, I figured everything out with like the John boat stuff and the big boat stuff. It was something like 32 tournaments between fountainhead BFLs, English choice. And then that's not counting any of like the weekday derbies that I'll just jump into. 
So it's probably close to 40 tournaments between March and October. So you are John and Cox. Okay. Yeah. Trying, <laughs> trying my best. I got to learn. I got, I got to put myself on the fast track with the big boat stuff because it's my first year truly fishing out of a big boat and competing in these larger fields. So I figured the more I do, the faster I'll learn. Um, but what it's been fun. I've really enjoyed it. Truly. What, what grade would you guys give yourselves as being your first year fishing the BFLs and everything? Mm, I'd give myself like a like a C minus. That's where I'm at. <laughs> Andrew, what the about first... you? Eh, C minus, probably. I'm with them. I'm still still trying to learn. Um, it's hard for a co angler because you don't know where you're going, especially with. The James coming up, I have no idea if I'm gonna end up in the Appomattox or the Chick or so I'm gonna be prepared for everything. Yeah, I think I give myself a C minus just because I started off on such a high and I just wasn't able to. I had a lot of confidence this year. Just I felt like having three days of practice, like traveling with the boys, that I'm I'll be able to put something together. So bombing the last two was definitely heartbreaking. But um, we're gonna okay. turn it around. Was Kerr a bomb? Yes. It was more of a bomb than High Rock? No. no. Well, I would say, actually, I would say yes, because I felt like I... High Rock, I just I could not figure out what to do. Like, I tried so much stuff and just couldn't get bit. Like, Kerr, I think I had the opportunity to get, like, a top 40 or 50, and I just blew it. I just ran around too much. I knew what I should have been doing, and I just couldn't... Just didn't do it. So, I, that's why... I, Kerr bothered me more than High Rock, I would say. Hmm. That's interesting. Because I, I would give you guys both, like everyone, like a B, B plus, because you were right there. Like Kerr, I mean, you know, I, I got to be in the boat with Matt with his stuff. Like he was doing kind of the same stuff people did to win and do well. So you're, it's not like you're in left field flipping docks at the creek that no one else is in and you don't get any bites. And then you can't even say like your thought process was right. You're, if your thought process is right, then there's only a few things that you have to like adjust to 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 have success so I, I don't know just it seems like from the outside looking in that your thought processes are not way off they're right there it just takes those one or two extra decisions and that's what happened to me at smith mountain was like i i was doing the right thing and it just clicked that day and and kerr and high rock it just didn't yeah what did you say matt i definitely feel the most confident about high rock and just like that with like the decision making part of it um if I'd fished clean, I'd definitely feel like, because I only had four fish um, and I had multiple shots at that limit. So like knowing what I could have had was enough to kind of like, that gives me confidence knowing that I was making the right decisions throughout the day to put myself in a position uh, for like a top 10. Because if I, I missed, I probably had three other fish hooked, one that jumped in through the bait, two others that I had pinned. Um, and that shook free that felt good but mm. i don't know it just knowing that i was and granted it's not like i was catching or getting 20 bites a day it was i literally had eight bites throughout the day and i caught four a couple of shorts too but um being in the position to do really well was enough for me to be like all right i can be here and compete mm. so but that was my biggest takeaway i think from the bf from that one from high rock so you thought your execution you thought your overall approach to high rock was better than Kerr, but Kerr, you, I, I would say you weren't that far off from Kerr either, or, or, or do you really feel like you were mm. more off than you think? I don't know. That's like, I literally edited that video today oh. and I realized that I actually did catch, I, I was catching fish throughout the day. And I, again, like just didn't fish clean. That's the last two from like the last two BFLs I missed a few key fish where like is make or break. And that's something I'm learning. Probably the biggest standout thing for me is like how important it is to fish clean, like, and how everything has to go your way. Like you can't have, and it's just bad luck. Like there's literally nothing I would have changed. Even like going back and rewatching these fish that are getting off. I'm like, it literally jumped in through the bait. Like there's nothing. I didn't give it too much slack or like, I didn't do something stupid. It's just, it's just the way it went. I don't know what I even could execution ch change. Yeah. It, it, I, I'm, I'm editing the video for my kayak tournament and 
it's first off this is the one thing if you guys don't have a gopro get a damn gopro you don't have to do youtube but it's like instant replay you could watch yourself first fish i had a four pounder and i was just winching on him like a monkey and i was pulling too hard and then he jumps uh, jumps at the yak throws the jig the next fish i didn't even have my net laid across because usually what you're supposed to do is lay your net down so you can easily net i still have the damn thing in in, in the holder behind me and so i'm screwing with this boom that one jumps off so that would have been two fish that would have gotten me probably close to first place that's just execution i was stupid and it really makes me think like you're right like how much of it is just one hook set or you just drop your focus for one second and then that's the biggest thing and then that influences your next decision and your next decision and then before you know it boom Mm -hmm. for sure we got two more questions here guys and then we're going to call it for the night uh justin marshall i have a question about live scope i'm seeing a schools of bass off points but they won't hit anything i have not caught a thing off a crank help uh who wants to go first everyone take a crack at it i think we know who, who needs to go first <laughs> <laughs> i haven't been catching them on the scope dude no i think, I think... go ahead matt you i don't know um i'm Okay, so normally if I'm seeing fish going through schools, I will come right off the bat here and say those are some of the hardest fish to catch. They have so much of the real thing in front of them that no matter what you throw, unless they're like hyper, hyper aggressive, will they even pay attention to? Because trust me, I've thrown it over a thousand of those fish. And I, I've caught some, one bait specifically, and it's specifically the stupid $25 depth spinner bait. For whatever reason, they'll bite that. Um, but I've tried things from Alabama rigs, crank baits, single swim baits, big swim baits, small swim baits, glide bait, uh, things like a bull shad, uh, everything, literally. And for whatever reason, the one that one specific spinner bait has caught me more fish than any other bait, but the second best producing thing would probably just be a regular three, eight to four, three Kai tech on a ball, ball head jig um, and just drop it right below the school and just swim it right underneath and hope one of those fish that are below it will eat it. If they're going through the school, like when you see the big ball and you can see a giant blob and then it disappears, normally there's really not much you can do in that scenario that I've found personally uh, to catch them well, or to be able to even like use that as a pattern to go off of throughout the day. Hunter. That's all I got. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing that bass that are feeding on schools, you're competing with the real thing and the, the real thing is going to usually get eaten nine out of 10 times. But um, yeah, live scope is just like any other, technique it's just repetition so the the best thing that i've done is when it comes to live scope is i've found a lake where they eat it really well and i go out there and i try a bunch of different baits and and get dialed in but um when i live scope it's i have a few baits on the deck and i take two or three casts with each and if they don't eat it i move on because it's hard to catch fish that are not eating really so unless you have a giant treble hook on the deck i think that <laughs> I think that is the best advice is listening to all you pro live scopers out there. It's no different than sight fishing for a spawner on a bed. You, you've got to read the body language of the animal and then just leave just because you can see it doesn't mean you're going to catch it. And I feel like a lot of people in the comment section now is like, well, clearly I bought the live scope. Therefore I must stick with this one fish and give it brain cancer by just beaming it for eight <laughs> hours. And it's like, that's that's a that's a folly and that's what really hurt me the very first tournament this year i had live scope i just it was too much information i didn't know how to do anything with it and then cut to high rock and half the time it's like yeah screw it like i'm not gonna worry about that fish that i'm seeing um so yeah uh, that, that's a that's a really good question yeah uh, I, I think the one thing that um a lot of people don't realize is just because you have live scope that you're probably going to catch I'd say close to like 1% of the fish you see. Matt and I had a day on a local reservoir here that I think we probably caught went like 50%. And that was insane. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's the best day I've had. But yeah, I'd say you're, you're looking at like a one to 5%, you know, percentage of like seeing fish and being able to catch them. Like it's, it's not something where you just turn it on and you're hunting fish all through the lake and catching every one. 
That's so interesting. I wonder where that's going to go then technology wise. Because are they just going to get completely turned off of it and they're just not going to be catchable? Because they're going to either read the clicking or they get used to drop shots being thrown at them like miraculously. Like, I don't know. Jacob Wheeler had an interesting one. Um, he was on the BTL podcast and he was saying that when he's fishing live scope fish, he has to be super quiet. And um, I think Pangrak was like, so you don't speak the fish? And he was like, no, like if I make noise, these fish that are out deep are so curious that they will swim to the boat and it's even harder to catch them. So I think that we're still in a phase where you can catch them using live scope. I don't think they're completely turned off by it, but I think places like Kerr um, that get just pounded that they're starting to really like they can, they can sense it and they don't like it. By the way, guys, make sure you follow Hunter's YouTube channel. This dude literally listens to like 10 podcasts per day. And so if it's in the fishing industry, he probably knows about it before the people that you know, created the product know about it. So he is very insightful with all this stuff. I agree with that 100%. Like all the guys I have on here keep saying like nowadays, they'll just point at the fish and then turn the trolling motor away and make the cast now, unlike yeah. years before. So I, I, I'm just always curious, like what the next trend is going to be with all that. Um, I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go. I think with all the trolling motors too and everything, I don't know. That's weird. That really is. I had another thought to finish the day. Oh yeah. I want to make sure we plug that. Uh, you caught something pretty cool yesterday. Uh, Matt, does that yeah. you want to wait for a video drop or do you want to talk about it? No, please it, it for sure. I caught a, an eight, eight, nine yesterday fishing the fountainhead bass club trail, uh, on the Occoquan reservoir crazy start or crazy part of the story this fish came out of the exact same tree as i caught my personal best which is a 95 and i'm pretty sure it's the same fish and it's like almost four miles from the ramp granted that was 14 months ago plenty of time for that fish to make it down there but i feel like somehow that fish made its way back and fell for my pink cinco <laughs> So how did you know to throw pink? I didn't. I I literally was like, we were having a tougher day. Like we were catching fish on shaky heads. And like, I think we had four in the box. Yeah, we had four fish and it's like one. Um, seeing a lot on the scope, trying a bunch of different things and just not really getting a ton of feedback. And I'm thinking like, okay, well, I know there's a lot of fish in trees. I want something that I can literally just like thread or weave through the branches and just give him a nice slow fall and like hopefully one will pick it up so i'm like digging through my plastics bag and i saw the bubble gum senko and i was like we need to do something stupid i literally said that to ace i'm like rigging this thing up um but it looked good with the watercolor because it wasn't chocolate milk it just had this nice like stain mm. to it like that green tint stain and that's where i find like your whites or bone or uh, bubble gum like really has that orb around it like when you bring it back up to the boat and you see it against the sun it has just this crazy glow. like light glow yeah it looks like a, it just looks good um so i put like a three thirty seconds uh, nail weight in the tail and i'm starting to just like pitch this thing into trees and like just drag it over the branches because it's not getting stuck i have it texas rigged and i come up to the front side of the tree we'd already fished it like the left side of it um probably made like five or ten casts on that side and i'm gonna work my way around it to the next set of trees and i'm sitting right on the, the top like on the bushy part and i just made a pitch maybe like 10 feet out in front of the boat and i'm just vertical jigging it through the branches and i let it drop and like i go to pull it up and i just feel it eat set the hook into it fish is stuck against the bottom of the branch and i'm like come on get out of there and it the way it's rolling, granted, this is only like two seconds. I, it feels like a catfish because it's so big. I mean, that's a really long fish. It's really like, I could just almost feel like it's rolling and it's stuck. I was like, screw it. I'm just like basically cranking this thing, horsing it. Um, and it comes up and Ace is there with a the net and it just goes right in. It was maybe like a seven second fight, eight second fight, luckily. Cause I was throwing it uh, on a spinning rod with oh my God. 10 pound test. <laughs> I was just looking for a keeper. Like I, I yeah. had no. You got it, dude. It, yeah, it was insane. And as soon as it got in the bag, I was like, no way. Like same fish, 
this is the same fish. Yep. Also, I will say the pink, the pink Senko, that is probably the best selling color at Fish and Pro Tech. We sell so many. It's we have so many guys that come in, they're like, I need the bubble gum. And me, me and Andrew were fishing um a neighborhood pond out of the pond prowler. And I hooked like a like a two pounder or whatever. And it spit out a pink Senko. And I was like, oh, it spit it out. But then I saw my Senko was still on the line. That fish had a pink Senko in its stomach and ate my pink Senko. <laughs> <laughs> didn't learn that's how i was like all right dialed <laughs> yeah, the color thing i feel like we can go down a rabbit hole with that and i would say that for another a, another rant another show about colors because yeah it's i mean hunter you you work for places like that i don't know how you pick just one color get them all <laughs> <laughs> he's got them all dude you saw his boat but things loaded down with like an extra thousand pounds of tackle you know, that, that's how I pay Matt for all the YouTube tips. I just give him tackle and then we're even. <laughs> you he need to always you, hook it up. Have you done a boat walkthrough yet, Hunter? Saving it. Just to I, show I, off I, how much crap you have. Yeah, I need to. I will I'll I will do that soon. But yeah, live stream it and just have people Cause guess. Because I have a small have. boat. Like I've probably got, you know, I'm running an 18 and a half foot boat right now. So I it's a difficult process trying to fit everything in there but yeah that's my basement probably has the same amount of stuff that i have in my boat holy shit dude I got a lot of stuff that. so it is um yeah tons of fun uh, we'll wrap this up guys thank you so much for uh for being here for the whole thing andrew um do you, any, you have anything you want to plug anything no i don't have any social media stuff but uh hps fishing and sb fishing they are a tag team. Hunter, yeah. you got when's your next video coming? Next video is coming this Thursday. I haven't decided what it is. I think it's going to be a night fishing tournament. But um, yeah, I'm going to go on the river tomorrow and see if I can film a frog fishing video. You got night fishing? Or e the evening tournament oh, things. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I have I have a I have a video lined up and it shows it shows some very sneaky stuff and I haven't decided if I want to post it yet. But I think. I'm out of videos, so I'm just gonna post it and give it's it a up. double edged sword, my friend. It's tough. It is tough. Uh, I think I do think that that is one thing about YouTube that it keeps you needing to be on your game because every week you're giving out exactly what you did you did well the week before. So <laughs> it uh it keeps you on your toes. You're really you're really grinding through it with your algorithm, and you're getting close to being monetized too. So congratulations, that's awesome. Appreciate it. I'm excited to get three cents a video. <laughs> Got to start somewhere, my friend. I'm getting four. So, my man, you Matt, and me, Matt, plug something. Uh, I guess we got the YouTube channel, SB Fishing, <laughs> Instagram, and TikTok OnlyFans. I'm supposed to be doing some TikTok here soon. I I'm. Mm. I'm indifferent on it, but I'll, I'll post some TikTok videos. Uh, that's, yeah, Nick, uh, next video is coming out tomorrow. It's going to be the BFL from Kerr. There's a lot of action throughout the day, actually. When I was, I did not remember. I, I think I blacked out that day. I didn't get a limit. I don't know why it just messed with me. I only had six pounds or seven pounds, something like that. But uh, a lot happened. <laughs> a lot happened throughout the day. It was good. I keep saying that like we're trying to end it, but yeah, I have to say it's so weird when you go back through the footage and you realize like what I remembered is not exactly what happened. And that happens. Never, it's when, never. And I'm not that I remember. It. Yeah. It's never. I sent Ace the clip of that eight that I caught yesterday. And he was like, dude, I thought you were saying like that it was a catfish when you were fighting it. And all the is Yeah. Completely. Both of us had completely different uh, ideas of how that thing went down. Literally. I, took me like seven seconds to get that fish in the bag and both of us thought it was like 30 seconds and just a lot crazier than it was but you're right like when you get to review it and like just look over your day or look over fish catches um like you're saying even if you don't do youtube i highly recommend it to anyone that fishes just because you really do learn a lot watching yourself fish throughout the day like small things too that can be extremely helpful 
No, good stuff. Good stuff. All right, guys, again, link in the episode description to everything that uh, we were talking about here. And then, of course, to all their channels, I'm going to privatize this. I'm going to clean up the audio tonight and I'm going to redump it on Wednesday as a podcast. That way you can listen to Apple, Spotify and iHeart. Uh, June, congratulations, guys. We're over 7000 downloads for the month of June, which is pretty insane. So good job there. And then, yeah. Uh, like and subscribe to every way they hear. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.